As, the, as we go to all of our staffs, so we're going to be telling the story um, of the Jewish experience in St. Louis <laughs> kind of backwards. And we're going to, um, we didn't do that on purpose, but it kind of worked out that way in a really nice, nice way. We'll be ending the ride at the Missouri History Museum. That's where we'll be ending, and you can get ice cream and water and restaurants and all that kind of stuff there. Um, for me, I'd like to do a little bit about the building that we're in. Was the United Hebrew Congregation, which, you know, their first space was near the riverfront, downtown St. Louis. Um, and they, this is the fifth location that that congregation was loca located in. This building was built in the 1920s, and then in 1989, the congregation moved west, and the Missouri Historical Society took over the space. And they've, we've altered it in big ways to fit our needs, but also left, you know, restored in big ways that, uh, that honor the building's history as well. So that's where we, that's kind of where you are. This the Library and Resource Center is open to the public. So this is a place that you can come. We have wonderful people that are literally just waiting for you to ask them amazing questions and they will go find the answers and help you get to them. Um, at the History Museum, I run a tour program that does walking and bus tours. So raise your hand if you've gone on a tour with me, not on a bicycle. Yes, anybody, anybody on a boat? Yeah, I do boat tours with Gateway River boats. Um, we have yeah, running tours with Go Marathon. Like yeah, we do we spread history in lots of lots of different ways. So hopefully I'll see you on one of those tours as well. So with that, I'm going to pass off to the incredible Warren. <laughs> Take it away, Warren. <laughs> My knees go weak. Um, uh, thank you, thank you for having me. I don't really know if I was the inspiration, but I think if I was, it was because I hoped somebody else was going to actually do it. <laughs> but, um, I want to start off with the fact that when, after the congregation had purchased this land and made clear their plans to build a synagogue in 1924, the neighbors of the Ellenwood Association there uh, sued to stop the building of the synagogue. And it was kind of an interesting moment, to say the least. In their um, covenants, the Ellenwood Homeowners Association uh, clearly stated that there would be no businesses in their zone except churches, libraries, and doctor's offices. <laughs> and so as you can imagine, the congregation said, well, you, you said accept churches, and you must mean religious spiritual houses of worship, and we're a house of worship, so what's wrong? And the Neighborhood Association responded, well, no, a synagogue is not just a house of worship the way a church is a house of worship. A synagogue is different. This is 1924. Yeah. And uh, this, then, of course, the lawyers will get in, and it gets really complicated. But the gist of things is this kind of incredulity on the part of the congregation, like, how are we not a house of worship? And the neighbors saying, well, because, you know, synagogues, you do all this other stuff. You're really, you know, you're going to do all this community building, and you're going to have, like, all these, you know, weddings and bar mitzvahs and, and, and messy picnics and lots of people talking with their hands. And, <laughs> <laughs> and um, you know, it's easy on the one hand, and this is going to get into, you know, some of the complexities of this tour, that right off the bat, you know, at least... Jewish, my first thought is anti-Semitism, you know, how can they say churches are okay and synagogues are not? But there is a certain truth there too, right? That not speaking about churches, but about synagogues, that they are very much more than houses of worship. They really are uh, community centers. They really are places for uh, building of a sense of belonging. They're also, and this, this gets, gets into another theme, they're also real statements of identity. And there's a lot of symbolism, and there's a lot of big symbolism, and big is kind of a keyword here in, in the building of synagogue. So I do think there is a, some anti-Semitic element there. Um, it went all the way up to the Missouri State Supreme Court. Uh, the judges, to their credit, said, um, you know, you said churches, but it looks like houses of worship. You can't really discriminate that way. And so the synagogue was built. Um, and it, 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 is, uh, it is very big, and it is much more than just a house of, of worship. Um, another interesting thing about synagogues, and we're going to look at a few of them on this trip, is that um, there is no blueprint for a synagogue. There really is no model. You know, there aren't, um, you know, the way that churches at least have the cathedrals, the, the fantastic cathedrals of Europe, as at least some sort of reference point, where Eastern Orthodoxy has its very long traditions. And Judaism doesn't have that. In fact, um, I think without overstating, I can say that synagogues really actually aren't really very important 
to Jewish, um, traditionally, at least religiously. You know, the important thing, the presence of God in Judaism is said to be there when there's a minion, which is ten adult men. Uh, the presence of God is already there when people are, when men are praying. It was also was very much about men. Women were excluded from the minion. Um, and, you know, for years and years and years, uh, Jewish communities in Europe and in the United States, in any case, didn't have the kind of resources to build grand structures. Uh, in Europe, in fact, if you've ever gone and visited synagogues in Europe, you see that a lot of them are actually completely hidden from the street. And that was often by a law. They, synagogues were not supposed to be making statements at all. Um, that was only in the late 19th century that in most countries they started allowing synagogues to be statements, to be, uh, do something with the architecture. So the point I'm making is that, you know, when it came to synagogue building, even in the 1920s, there was really kind of an open question, what do you do, how do you build this place? And a lot of architects just kind of reached back to history and kind of cherry-picked and tried to find something that they thought historically would be honestly kind of cool and also maybe something to build on. And maybe because there was so much of a train of suffering in Jewish history, also a feeling like maybe we can find somewhere where the Jewish history was a little bit more ennobled, you know? And the, and the last thing I'll mention is they didn't want it to look like a church, right? In, in America, where churches are everywhere, a place like St. Louis, where there's these beautiful churches seemingly on every corner, it was important that the synagogue looked at it. Which brings us to this place. Um, it's often referred to as a Byzantine style, um, which, of course, is reaching back uh, to the age of Byzantium. Um, there's a reference here with this amazing uh, ceiling to the most famous Byzantine structure of all, which is the Hagia Sophia in, um, in Istanbul, what was Constantinople. Um, the architects, Meritz and Young, did not come up with that idea of drawing on the Byzantine tradition. They actually were borrowing from a Chicago architect by the name of Paul Schuler, who did also build a building in St. Louis, which we're going to see in a few minutes on, over in UC. Um, inspired by Paul Schuler's uh, Temple Isaiah, which still stands in Hyde Park in Chicago. Um, they, they, they took that idea of, of borrowing from Constantinople and kind of reaching back. And part of this is that the, um, the Jews of St. Louis, most of them were Ashkenazi, which is to say their origins were in Northern Europe. And there was this really strong trend among the Ashkenazis, again, in part because of their own tragic history and the kind of misery that they'd left behind in Europe, there was this sense almost to kind of fetishize the Jews of the Middle East, the Jews of, of Northern Africa, um, known as Sephardi. And this feeling that the Sephardi were, were more dignified. And the Sephardi, um, they got along better. I mean, it's kind of ironic, but the Sephardi got along really well with their neighbors, the Muslims. And they were much more tolerated than the Jews were in Christian Europe for centuries. And so there was this little trend there to reach to the East and to build these kind of Oriental quote unquote structures, and this would be one of those examples. Um, uh, Merritt and Young, the architects, uh, were mostly known otherwise for building houses. They built a lot of really beautiful houses around town. They were really important. I believe they were based in St. Louis, but in any case, hundreds of houses here uh, built by Merritt and Young. They had to uh, get a lot of consultants to do the complexity of these work. Uh, it's said that it's one of the three was one of the three largest synagogues in America at the time that it was built. I believe somebody just asked me about this. I believe this is a false floor, it is right? A false we, floor. Yeah. And um, the Ark uh, Dima was, I believe, over here. Obviously, there was a balcony. Although this was um, uh, by the time they built this, this was considered a reform congregation. It was not original reform. It goes all the way back to 1841 as a congregation, which is the oldest congregation in St. Louis. Uh, but it was originally traditional, which means the women and the men would have been separated. Um, honestly, it's, I think it's kind of unusual that they have a balcony, but it wasn't, um, they were definitely were not separated by, by gender. And, um... It, first, uh, first, first one, congregation <coughs> west of the Mississippi. And the first congregation <laughs> west of the Mississippi, thank you, 1841. And one more addition about the building itself is, and it, this will touch on themes that we'll get on later, is the connection between civil rights in the Jewish community in St. Louis, and that's that uh, Martin Luther King gave us his last speech in St. Louis, was given here in 1960. So there's a big, another big moment of history that happened here that connects to the themes that we'll touch on today. Oh, and if I can make a plug for my friends at the Missouri Historical Society, uh, they have the pulpit 
where Martin Luther King spoke, and they are trying to restore it. And there's a GoFundMe page um, for uh, going towards the cost of restoring that pulpit so that at some point they could put it on our display. They did not I wondered about that too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. I have one more announcement. Um, and, and of course, we want to take your questions. Maybe you can save them for the next spot. But, um, so we have, a, we have a couple of safety riders 